spirituality is, has become kind of an in thing these days. Something you notice, it's ubiquitous now. You're not a proper corporate company unless you have a spiritual guru. There's they, they, what's the show that Silicon Valley, they do a kind of, I mean, there's, a, there's a character in there, this Indian guy who's a guru to these CEOs in, in Silicon Valley, but it's really becoming true these days. Like they, they spend a lot of money, Google and these other companies to bring in these spiritual gurus to talk to the, to the employees. Um, mindfulness apps, meditation apps, apps relating to spirituality are um, proliferating. On dating websites, it's kind of a plus if you say I'm spiritual on top of everything else. Um, so that's a good thing, of course. Spirituality is becoming more ubiquitous, more mainstream, but there are also dangers in spirituality becoming so mainstream, I would say. Um, and the other thing is, it's not just about spirituality, but it's about like, it's, it's a, there's certain forms of spirituality that tend to be most popular. Um, one of them I've already mentioned, which is mindfulness. And there are lots of mindfulness retreats and stuff like that. And another kind is what is often called Neo Advaita, which means this just basically telling yourself constantly, I am Brahman, I am pure consciousness, this world is a dream. And so I'm thinking of these trends in particular that have certain dangers, I think. So one of them is that this is the one thing is that it can itself become a source of ego. You, it's, it's a kind of another talking point to brag about to your friends. And, to, and so it, it's, it's a way of possibly, if you're not sincere about it, it can actually lead to greater ego rather than lesser ego. But there's a more subtle danger here too about these specific practices. If you don't do it properly, I'm not saying that these practices are bad, but these are dangers along the way if, if you don't do them properly. The danger is this, that I think it, you can easily slip into over-intellectualism with the, both these practices. Mindfulness, where you end up kind of just almost becoming narcissistic and obsessed with your own mind and its workings. And with Neo-Advaita, it's the whole practice can easily become intellectual if you don't have the, the spiritual prerequisites to actually practice it properly. And so just telling yourself, I am Brahman, I am pure consciousness, I am the witness. It's just a kind of verbal statement, a kind of intellectual game that you can play. But it doesn't go deep. It doesn't sink into the heart. And I think that's one of the biggest problems. These are very glamorous spiritual practices, but they may not be that effective for many people. I want to talk today about a much less glamorous practice but arguably a much more effective practice. It's prayer. And one of the reasons why I think it's so effective, in spite of it not being glamorous, why is it not being glamorous? Or why is it not glamorous? That's a kind of separate lecture, but it has to do with kind of uh, contemporary skepticism, just kind of, it just seems so quaint and traditional. Um, you have to believe in a God and God as a, as a supreme personal being and all this stuff that seems to be antiquated. That's a separate lecture and I would have to give arguments in support of all that, the existence of God and all that. But why is prayer so effective? I think prayer is effective because it forces you to speak from the heart and not necessarily even to speak from the heart, but to just dwell at the heart level rather than staying at the mind level. Um, Pascal, Blaise Pascal, the great French scientist slash uh, Christian mystic, mystic actually toward the end of his life, he used to say the heart has its reasons of which reason knows nothing. And Bhagavad Gita, in Bhagavad Gita there's a beautiful line, there's a practice explained where Krishna says, Sarvadvarani sanyamya mano hridi nirudhyacha, which means um, stopping all the all the gates of the senses, so go inward, and stop the mind in the heart. Restrain the mind in the heart. Our minds are constantly racing. I'm giving a lecture tomorrow in Trabuco Canyon on the pain body, a Vedantic perspective, on Eckhart Tolle. And uh, Eckhart Tolle talks a lot about how our minds are just hyperactive. We're constantly thinking, and we end up identifying with those thoughts in the mind. So prayer is a really helpful way of just breaking that unconscious identification with thinking, with mind, because it forces us to go inward into the heart. William Butler Yeats, 
in one of my favorite poems, um, The Circus Animal's Desertion, published in 1939, the final lines are as follows. He says, now that my ladder is gone, I must lie down where all the ladders start in the foul rag and bone shop of the heart. So this foul rag and bone shop of the heart, that's what we're going to be entering today. This is what prayer does for us. So think about it this way. What's the essential thing in spiritual life? It's to become humble, to become selfless, right? To diminish egoism. We're told that constantly. Every single yoga has the primary aim of curbing our ego, making us more compassionate, more generous, more selfless. And I think prayer, because of that, it's one of the most effective practices because it, if you do it right, it forces you to become humble because it's built into the structure of the prayer practice. If you look at many of you, I'm sure, have read at least parts of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. If you ask yourself, what is the practice that is most recommended by Sri Ramakrishna? and most practiced by Sri Ramakrishna, I mean both. Look at the, the spiritual practice he recommends to others, the, his visitors. And secondly, what is he doing most of the time? And what you'll find in the gospel is, either he's in Samadhi, in some very high state of spiritual consciousness, or he's talking to God, or he's calling on God, or he's singing, but even the, sing, even the songs tend to be prayers, prayers to God. We'll get to that a bit later. So I think, and this is not just me, I mean, there's a very senior Swami in our order, he's a vice president named Swami Bhajanan, the Hari as he knows him well. He would often say, he said that in the gospel, Sri Ramakrishna has created a new yoga. I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact words, but he said, what's the new yoga? Prathana yoga. Prathana means prayer in Sanskrit, in Bengali. The yoga of prayer. Why call it a separate yoga? Obviously it's a bhakti practice, it falls under bhakti yoga, that's true. But I think what's important about what he's saying, and I think he's right about this, is that prayer itself is a self-sufficient practice. It can take you all the way to the, high, to the highest goal. Prayer itself is not just the means, but also the end of spiritual practice. What do I mean by that? As a means, you pray in order to purify the mind, cultivate bhakti, love for God, and ultimately attain God realization. As an end, look at Sri Ramakrishna constantly talking to mother, complaining to mother, crying to mother, like a child. There's no greater state than that. There's no higher state than talking. And you might say, well, that doesn't sound like the highest state. It's very interesting. He distinguishes in many places the spiritual states of jnana and vijnana. And he says jnana is, he gives different explanations of, these, of the contrast between these two stages, but I'm giving you in one context, in several contexts, he says the following. He says, jnana is like, it can only take you to the, uh, you can't get to the, to the real inner chambers of, of a palace. You'll know that God exists, but you can't get further than that knowledge. And he says, vigyana is a deeper, more intimate knowledge of God, not just knowledge, but acquaintance with God communion with God. And he says that the Vigyani feels God as a constant presence and so is literally constantly talking to God. That's the sign of a Vigyani, which is the most evolved kind of uh, spiritual soul, even further than just knowledge of Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness. So in that sense, prayer as end. So prayer is not only the means, but prayer is the highest end. And in that sense, I think it's, I think it's very accurate and helpful to think about prayer as a yoga, as a self-sufficient yoga in its own right. St. Paul in 1 Thessalonians, he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. There's a striking phrase, pray without ceasing. There's a great Russian monk we don't even know his name. He wrote a book, which many of you probably have read, The Way of a Pilgrim. And he went to church once and he heard the priest recite this statement of St. Paul's, pray without ceasing. It just, it just struck him. 
We all hear the phrase. Many of us have heard the statement, but we don't think about it. He heard it and he's like, what does that mean? And how is it possible? He couldn't sleep, he couldn't rest because he couldn't understand how one could possibly pray without ceasing. And so he would go from one great saint to another and this religious leader, this teacher and spiritual guru, asking them the same question. Remember how Swami Vivekananda would run around Kolkata asking, have you seen God, have you seen God? So this is similar. This pilgrim, this Russian pilgrim is going around asking, how is it possible to pray without ceasing? And he meets a holy man one day and the holy man says, ceaseless interior prayer is a continual yearning of the human spirit towards God. To succeed in this consoling exercise, we must pray more often to God to teach us to pray without ceasing. Pray more and pray more fervently. It is prayer itself which will reveal to you how it can be achieved unceasingly, but it will take some time. So this is a beautiful advice. How do we pray without ceasing? Pray. Pray, pray with ceasing <laughs> in order to pray without ceasing. So pray in, in as best you can, as sincerely as you can. Obviously, with you're going to get distracted here and there. You're going to get tired, bored, a million things. Keep doing it. And pray to God to teach you how to pray without ceasing. It's another beautiful thing about prayer. You're not in this alone. Many of these other practices, this neo advaita this mindfulness, these things. Often I heard, look, I mean, it depends on what kind of mindfulness tradition you practice and what kind of retreat it is. But I've, I've heard from some friends of mine who've done some mindfulness retreats who say that they're very rigid about set all your prior beliefs and practices and spiritual inclinations at the door and do what we tell you and none of these fanciful beliefs in a higher power. So it means it's completely your own self-effort. It's called purushakara in Sanskrit, these kinds of spiritual practices. And that can be very daunting. And it's a great source of consolation, support, that there is a, there's somebody who loves us out there who can help us and we can call on him to help us in our spiritual practices. That's another nice thing about prayer. So this Russian pilgrim, he starts repeating the Jesus prayer continually. What's the Jesus prayer? There are different forms, but one of the main ones is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And he meets another monk who tells him how he should be repeating this prayer mentally. He says, the continuous interior prayer of Jesus is a constant, uninterrupted calling upon the divine name of Jesus with the lips in the spirit, in the heart, while forming a mental picture of his constant presence and imploring his grace during every occupation, at all times, in all places, even during sleep. The appeal is couched in these terms, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Actually, dropping the uh, on me, a sinner, is more Vedantic in a way. There's a, there are different variants. So this is a shorter version. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. This is very Vedantic. The moment you add a sinner, it becomes, you get original sin and that stuff. That, let me continue the quote, though. This saint is telling him, one who accustoms himself to this appeal experiences as a result so deep a consolation and so great a need to offer the prayer always that he can no longer live without it and it will continue to voice itself within him of its own accord. It's very striking how similar this is to um, ideas you find in Indian spiritual traditions. And I'm thinking of one in particular, it's the idea of ajapa japa. Japa, as most of you know, is mental repetition of a mantra given to you by a qualified guru. Ajapa japa means that mental repetition of the mantra happens spontaneously without even your making any conscious effort to do it. As a sadhana, as a spiritual practice, we consciously repeat the mantra mentally, right? And our gurus tell us to do it at least twice a day, following these instructions. Ajapa japa means you've attained a state, it's an achievement actually, where you don't have to make an effort anymore, it just bubbles up from within. And that seems to be exactly what this uh, Christian saint is talking about. And notice that that mental repetition is itself a form of prayer. We're gonna to get to that in a second. I think one of the problems that we have 
with prayer and why we're so reluctant to practice it is because I think we have far too narrow an understanding of what prayer is. So I want to one and I'm, a, I'm kind of a nerd. I'm a philosopher. And so I, I like definitions. And so I'm going to give you all the different or at least many different definitions of prayer, different ways to pray. Um, but before we get to that, one other thing I'll mention is just that um, many of you have probably heard of the great American novelist J.D. Solinger. So he wrote a book called a novel called Franny and Zoe. Um, and that book is actually centered around this theme of praying without ceasing. It's about this young girl who reads the way of a pilgrim and just it, she becomes obsessed with it. And it's about her. And it's not a coincidence that J.D. Solinger was initiated by Mikhail Anandaji, one of our great monks, the great translator of the Sri Sri Ramakrishna Kothamrita as the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. He was the head of one of our New York centers. So there's a connection with Vedanta there. Okay, so now we get into the talk proper, even though I've already covered about 20 minutes, but anyway. Okay, so I wanna do a few things. One, what exactly is prayer? What are the different kinds of prayer? And also, how do we deepen our prayer practice? How do we know we're making progress? Um, I'll also try to discuss some doubts that many of us as sadhakas, as spiritual aspirants, have about <clears throat> prayer practice. And I'll end very briefly with some practical tips on prayer. So first, what exactly is prayer? I think the best and broadest definition of prayer is as follows. This is, it's not very controversial, but I think many people aren't aware of this. Um, there's a philosopher named George Mavrodis who says, prayer is any sort of communication which is addressed to God. Any way of communicating with God counts as prayer. So now with that broad definition of prayer in the background, what are some different kinds of prayer? I'll mention eight. There are many more, but I'm just mentioning it. The most common kind of prayer and the one that often what we do is we restrict prayer to just this form of prayer, but I think it's a mistake. It's like restricting Vedanta to Advaita Vedanta. I think that's another serious mistake. There's so many schools of Vedanta and yet we think Vedanta means Shankara school of Advaita, wrong. Same thing. But so prayer does not just mean this, but this is a major form of it. Verbal petitionary prayer. Verbal petitionary prayer. Verbal, you speak words. Petitionary, you ask, you're asking God for something. That's what petitioner. So that's the most common understanding of prayer. Many people think that's what prayer is. And that's all that prayer is. I talk to God who may or may not exist and I ask him for things, usually worldly things. <laughs> right? Heal my son. Bless him so that he gets a perfect score on his exam. Uh, bless me so that I get that job I've been wanting for, wanting for so many years. And so on. Um, that's why great saints, they always say, that's good. You should do verbal petitionary prayer. That's wonderful. But try to pray for spiritual things. Holy Mother would go so far as to say, when somebody asked her, what should I pray for? She said, pray for desirelessness. It's a very spiritual prayer. And Swami Vivekananda, he used to suggest that the best prayer is, thy will be done. See, because as spiritual aspirants, we're still identified with ego. We don't know what's best for us from a spiritual standpoint. How do we know that what we're asking for from God isn't the ego speaking? So better to just say, Lord, I don't even know what's good for my spiritual life. Thy will be done. Um, Saint Evagrius, a great Christian monk. There's, there's a collection of the teachings of the Desert Fathers called Philokalia. So it's from this. Saint Evagrius says, do not pray for the fulfillment of your wishes, for they may not accord with the will of God. And those wishes may come from the ego. Then he says, but pray as you have been taught, saying, thy will be done in me. Always entreat God in this way, that his will be done. For he desires what is good and profitable for you, whereas you do not always ask for this. We don't know what's really good for us from a spiritual standpoint. And the ego has a way of convincing us that we want things and that yes, yes, this is what you want. This will make you, this will help you with your spiritual progress. In fact, the opposite happens. It's the ego in disguise in the form of prayer. So better to ask thy will be done. Anyway, 
Second kind of prayer, the prayer of surrender. Surrendering to God, the act of trying to surrender to God is itself a form of prayer. How do we know this? Gospel again. Sri Ramakrishna, he will often give, he will often pray verbally, kind of openly, so that people can hear his prayer, to set an example of what kind of the way that you should pray to God. And one of these prayers, beautiful prayers, he says is, O Divine Mother, O Mother, Ami Jontra Tumi Jontri, I am just a mere instrument in your hands. Shoro Nagoto, Shoro Nagoto, I take refuge at your lotus feet. Naham Naham tu, tu. Not I, not I, but thou, O Lord. This is the prayer of surrender. Many of you have attended our evening vespers, our arati, in Hollywood, it's at 6 p.m. Um, Swami Vivekananda composed the first two arati songs, the first in Bengali and the second in Sanskrit. And the refrain in the second song, one thing that's very really interesting, if you read the complete works, you'll think that Swami Vivekananda was a great jnani, which he was, and it, he taught Advaita Vedanta all the time. These two songs he composed, full of bhakti and surrender. And so the second song, the refrain is, Tasmat tvam eva sharanam mamadina bandho. Therefore I take refuge at your lotus feet. O Lord, and the epithet for Lord here is, my dina bandho. O oh, you who are the friend of the lowly. You might think this is very unusual for Swami Vivekananda who's saying, don't call yourself weak and low, but this is him speaking from his heart. He told Nivedita that toward the end of his life, he said, Sri Ramakrishna was all bhakti on the outside and all jnana on the inside. And I am all jnana on the outside and all bhakti on the inside. And I'm apt to weep at, at the least opportunity. And he's so emotional, actually. If you, if you look at his life, you can't understand Swami Vivekananda by just reading complete works. These were his lectures, public lectures mostly. Look at his life. Third kind of prayer, the prayer of recollection, the prayer of remembrance. This is what Sri Ramakrishna calls in, in the gospel, Shorbada Shoron Monon, Smarana Manana in Sanskrit, which means constantly thinking or reflecting on God. Not reflecting, remembering God. In fact, Ramanuja, the great Indian philosopher, South Indian philosopher, who founded one of the most important bhakti schools of Vedanta, Vishishta Advaita Vedanta. He said that the highest practice is bhakti yoga, and that can take us directly to God realization. But he defined bhakti yoga in a very specific way. He said that bhakti yoga, true bhakti yoga, the highest kind of bhakti yoga, devotion, is constant recollection of God. Like an uninterrupted flow of oil, stream of oil. This is a classic Indian example, analogy, where you pour oil from one vessel into another, and there's an unbroken stream. Just like that. The mind has absolutely no other thoughts other than God. Even if you try to think about something else, your mind will pull you back to God. It's a very high state of spiritual achievement, actually. So this is, again, one of these things that is both an end, a means and an end. As a means, it's something that we should practice. Try to, try to think of God as much as you can. Of course, we'll fail. As an end, you can't help but think of God constantly, like Sri Ramakrishna. Brother Lawrence, uh, in uh, a series of letters which has become famous called Practice of the Presence of God, he describes this kind of prayer. He says, his own, and he speaks of himself in the third person, his own prayer was nothing else but a sense of the presence of God. His soul being at that time insensible to everything but divine love. So what does that mean? It means he just feels the presence of God constantly. That's constant recollection. At, just as if I feel, just like I feel your presence now because you're in the room, but he felt, he felt God in the same way. You see, that's such a wonderful state. Sri Ramakrishna also in the gospel, I think that it's, if you ask him what was, or if you ask what was his most common prayer, he's, he, he's verbally uttered a lot of prayers, but that wasn't the most common prayer, in my opinion. The most common prayer, which he's literally 24 seven, which he was, doing, practicing spontaneously, is this prayer of recollection. Constant, spontaneous, effortless recollection. How do we know this? He says the following, January 2nd, 1884. I don't care for japa and austerity, but I have constant remembrance and consciousness of God. 
He says it. He can't help but think of God constantly. There's another beautiful incident when Hazra, who is a somewhat problematic figure in our tradition, uh, he, he loved doing japa, and he developed a kind of superiority complex because he would do more japa than other people, other visitors of Sri Ramakrishna. And he would brag about it and criticize others. They don't do any japa. They're not doing any real spiritual practice. And so one day Sri Ramakrishna looks at him as he's doing japa and says, give me those beads. He takes the beads. He says, let me try this. So he's first, you know, you're supposed to, in India, the right hand is auspicious, which is bad for me because I, I was born a lefty. And so when I first moved, when I first came to Bilumat and joined as a monk, there was one monk I remember who took me aside and like, it's like, he noticed I was writing with my left hand. He was like, he was like personally offended by that. And so I said, you know, it's not good to, to, to use your left hand for these things. It's not a spiritual hand, he said. I, I remember getting a little irritated with it. <laughs> anyway, and I was, I just joined and so I was kind of like a little fiery. So it, it turned into a bit of an argument. Um, how did I get, oh yeah, oh yeah, back to Sharam Gusev's story. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so Sharam Gusev. In India, right hand is auspicious. You're supposed to do japa with your, tell the beads with your right hand. So he starts. He can't. I mean, literally, his mouth is locked. Mother won't let him. So he says, okay, let me take my, the dirty hand, the hand where, I, mean, I won't explain why it's considered dirty. In India. <laughs> Many of you know. But anyway, so he takes the japa mala into his left hand, and he starts doing it. With his left hand, which is the inauspicious hand, the unspiritual hand, repeating the mantra once or twice, it, it just spontaneously the fingers stop and he soars into the highest state of samadhi. What does that mean? It means that for him, japa is not a practice. And that, constant, that recollection is so constant that you don't need to repeat the name because it, it's this ajapa japa state. Right? Fourth kind of prayer the prayer of adoration and worship. This is very common, especially in. Christian hymns, like the whole Catholic Mass, it's full of this. Laudamus te, benedicimus te, adoramus te, glorificamus te, it's Latin. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. The first line of our first Arati song, composed by Swami Vivekananda in Bangla. Kondono bhavo bondono jago bondono bun mai. We praise you, O Lord, who destroys all our worldly bondages. Fifth kind of prayer, the prayer of thanksgiving, thanking God. Also very common in Christianity. Another line from the Catholic Mass, gratias agimus tibi propter magnum gloriam tuum. We give thanks, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. And of course, we have our thanksgiving here, which we celebrate. That's why we do grace beforehand. Sixth kind of prayer, the prayer of longing or yearning. This is what Sri Ramakrishna in Bangla called Vyakulata, Bakulata. This is also one of the keynotes in the entire gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Longing, longing, longing. There's an incident when Balaram's father, a great devotee, and a, a staunch Vaishnava, so they believe in taking God's name constantly. And so he's sitting in Sri Ramakrishna's room, telling his beads, very quietly, extremely humble, self-effacing person, very sincere spiritual aspirant. That context is important. Sri Ramakrishna notices that he's doing this. In front of everybody, he asks, you know, people do, are doing so much japa, and he kind of looks at him so everybody knows who he's talking about. Repeating his name all day, and yet why is he making no progress? <laughs> it's as if there are 18 months in a year, he says. He says, because there's no longing behind it. There's no longing behind it. It becomes mechanical. And then he says, just to kind of twist the knife a bit, he says, I notice sometimes when I go to Kolkata, even the prostitutes tell their beads. Which is good, good for the prostitutes, but what his point is that just doing japa is not enough. It's about that inner feeling. You have to have this inner feeling. So the goal of true prayer is to just have this genuine longing for God. In fact, Sri Ramakrishna would say, having that longing is like that rosy dawn, that just the first glimmer of the sun coming up before the sun actually comes out in full blaze. He says, then you know that you won't have much longer to wait before God realization. It's that highest state, that genuine longing for God. 
it's a very high state. At the same time, one thing I'll mention at the very end when I get to the kind of practical tips is that when we listen to music with great concentration or when we sing ourselves, ideally in private, it can give us a glimpse of that genuine longing because that singer, if it's a beautiful spiritual song, just for those moments when we're fully concentrated and identified with the song and with the singer. It's T.S. Eliot, one of my favorite poets, my favorite poet, he used to say, he describes a state song. He says, you are the music while the music lasts. If you really enter into that state, like Sri Ramakrishna would do constantly in the gospel, then you, you get that taste of longing just for a few moments, and then you come back to earth, but at least you get, you know what the goal is. So music is, is a really beautiful way to make this very high spiritual state of longing accessible to everybody. Gandhiji, Mahatma Gandhi, he used to say, he who hungers for the awakening of the divine in him must fall back on prayer. But it is not a repetition of an empty formula. It is better in prayer to have a heart without words than words without heart. So I really like that last sentence. Better, to, better in prayer to have a, a heart without words. You don't have to speak, actually. I, I hope that's part of, I mean, what, part of the reason I'm giving you all these definitions of prayer is that many of these are nonverbal. Longing is not necessarily verbal. Anyone who ever fell in love will know that, right? The Psalms in the Hebrew Bible are also, almost all of them, they're prayers to God and they're prayers of longing, full of longing. As a deer pants for water, oh, do I pant for thee, O Lord. And some of the great classical composers in the West have set these beautiful Psalms to music. This is some of my favorite songs like Bach and Mozart and Beethoven and others, Buxtehude. Seventh kind of prayer, the prayer of confession and repentance. Also very common in Christian traditions. But in Christian traditions often, especially in the Catholic tradition, there's an intermediary, there's a priest, and there's a confession booth, and you go to that priest and you confess to, 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 to the priest. In Hinduism, in Vedanta, no intermediary is necessary. You can confess to your guru if you want, but your guru is God. But just go straight to God, it's the best thing. Sri Krishna himself would recommend that. He says, Sri Krishna says, one cannot see God without purity of heart. Through attachment to lust and greed, the mind has become stained, covered with, with dirt, as it were. A magnet cannot attract a needle if the needle is covered with mud. Wash away the mud and the magnet will draw it. Likewise, the dirt of the mind can be washed away with the tears of our eyes. This stain is removed if one sheds tears of repentance and says, O oh Lord, I shall never again do such a thing. Thereupon, God, who is like the magnet, draws to himself the mind, which is like the needle. Then the devotee goes into samadhi and obtains the vision of God. So notice what he's saying here. Whatever you've done, good, bad, otherwise, confess it directly to God. You don't need to tell anybody else in the world, but tell God openly with tears in your eyes. Tears in your eyes. You'll find this is another thing he says constantly. Not just pray. Pray with tears in your eyes. Why? Because tears are a sign of sincerity and genuine feeling. If you just mechanically repeat, oh, I'm sorry I did this thing. That's one thing. But genuinely shedding tears for what you've done to God. That's what's going to work from a spiritual standpoint. Eighth kind of prayer, so that we don't spend the entire talk just defining prayer. Prayer of unburdening, unburdening yourself. This is very similar in a way to confession, but it's broader, I think. Holy Mother recommended this kind of prayer, Shara the Devi. She used to say, tell Takur, meaning Sri Ramakrishna, whatever feelings and worries are in your mind and pray to him. See, it's not just confession, it's anything, whatever's on your mind, which you'll usually complain to your spouse about or, you know, your friends, just tell God. Then she says, confess all your worries and sufferings to him with tears in your eyes. You will see that he will then take you onto his lap. So what's the whole point? Why do I spend so much time defining these eight different kinds of prayer? And there are many more. Because it helps us to, first of all, avoid this, this danger of too narrowly defining prayer and thinking that it means only verbal petitionary prayer. There are many, many different kinds of prayer. And it gives us a kind of arsenal, a whole, so that we can learn how to pray without ceasing. Because in different circumstances in life, in our day-to-day -day life, 
certain forms of prayer are more realistic than other forms of prayer. You see, you can't engage in verbal petitionary prayer when you're giving a lecture or something or when you're talking to somebody else, usually. If you're at the stage of ajapa japa, that will be going on within, but that's a separate issue. But there are so many other ways you can still be praying. Even when you're arguing with your spouse, even when you're at work, talking to your coworkers, concentrating on some difficult mathematical problem, there's always a prayer in every circumstance. That's, that's, that's the main reason why I explain this in such detail. Now, a couple more things. How do we as spiritual aspirants know that we're making spiritual progress in this practice of prayer? Uh, again, I think it's useful to bring in Eastern Orthodox Christian teachings, these great desert fathers, because one of their main practices was called hesychasm, H-E-S-Y-C-H-A-S-M, hesychasm. The English translation is often prayer of the heart. That was one of their main practices. And as I mentioned in the context of the way of a pilgrim, it's the mental repetition of the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. And they would explain that there are these three stages in hesychasm, in this practice of hesychasm, prayer of the heart. The first stage is what they called catharsis. These are Greek terms. This is the stage of purification, self-purification. We're engaging in prayer because our minds are full of dirt, impurities, worldliness. And so through prayer, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, when you pray with tears in your eyes, those tears will wash away the mud covering over the soul and give you that purity that you're looking for. And in this context, Sri Ramakrishna would say again and again, kina kina pratana. That's why you should pray with tears in your eyes. Saint Evagrius, the great desert father, would say exactly the same thing. He said, pray with tears and all you ask will be heard. For the, Lord, for the Lord rejoices greatly when you pray with tears. So that's the first stage. And in this stage, you'll find that uh, the, when, when you pray, sometimes it is mechanical, sometimes it's not from the heart, but you're trying your best. That's the idea. Second stage, called theoria. Theoria, that's where the word theory comes from but they define it in the spiritual sense of illumination. This is not God realization, that's the third stage. But it's a kind of very spontaneous prayer with a genuine feeling of longing for God behind it. So it's a very high stage of prayer practice. It's prayer, not at the mental level, but purely coming from the heart, welling up from within spontaneously without any distracting worldly thoughts. So, then, the third and final stage, this is the culminating stage of prayer. The ultimate aim of our prayer practice is what they call theosis, which literally means divinization. You become one with God. You realize God in your own heart and that you are yourself a spark of that divine fire. And as for doubts, sometimes we have doubts about prayer. One, one doubt is actually voiced in the gospel. A pandit, a great pandit, asks Sri Ramakrishna, does God listen to our prayers? This is a doubt that comes up. Or are we just talking to ourselves like crazy people? And I, that's, I added that. Sri Ramakrishna says the following, his answer. God is the kalpaturu, the wish-fulfilling tree. You will certainly get whatever you ask of him, but you must pray standing near the kalpaturu. Only then will your prayer be fulfilled. But you must remember another thing. God knows our inner feeling, dini bhavgrahi. A man gets the fulfillment of the desire he cherishes while practicing sadhana. This is a very wordy translation of a beautiful Bengali statement. Sri Ramakrishna was a great wordsmith and poet. And so he would often rhyme words to, to really etch them into the minds of his listeners. So the original Bangla is jamun bhav timni lab. Bhav, bhav lab. Bhava. As is your bhava, so is your attainment. Lava means attainment. And bhava means spiritual attitude, your inner feeling. That's all that means. So what is Sri Ramakrishna saying here? God is a wish-fulfilling tree. He'll give you whatever you want on two conditions. What are the two conditions? Condition one, you should be close to the tree, the wish-fulfilling tree. You have to get close to it. You can't be 100 miles away and expect the tree to give you what, what you're looking for. What does it mean to be close to God? You, you get closer to God, the more pure you become and the more you think of God and the more longing you have for God. So cultivating that longing for God is crucial to having God respond to your prayers. 
And secondly, you have to be absolutely sincere. And he says, God is bhabgrahi, another beautiful Bengali phrase, which Nikolanji renders as God knows our inner feeling, which is quite nice as a translation. Even if we verbally ask God for something, maybe in our heart of hearts, we don't want that. This often happens actually, because we often don't know what we really want, but God knows what we really want. So even if God doesn't give us what we are asking for verbally, he might be giving us what we're actually wanting more deeply, even if we ourselves don't know what we really want. That's another aspect of this. And so just keep in mind that the, the pure we become, the less worldly, the less preoccupied we are with worldly things, the more effective our prayers will also become. But that doesn't mean that we should first become pure and then pray. Prayer itself is both the, the means and the end. That's why Sri Ramakrishna will say again and again, pray with tears in your eyes, because through genuine prayer, you, you're able to purify the mind. You, those tears wipe away the mud covering over our, our souls. Another, this is a kind of an interesting doubt that only a philosopher can come up with. Uh, many of the prayers recommended by Sri Ramakrishna in the gospel tend to be things like this. He'll say things like, I already told you one of them. I'm a mere instrument in your hands, O Lord. There are other prayers where um, he says, I don't want bodily pleasures. I don't want name and fame. I don't want any of the eight occult powers. I want only pure love for your lotus feet. And so on. That's one of the standard prayers that you find in the gospel. And a question might arise, a doubt might arise. And he's encouraging us to repeat this. The thing is, he can say that because he really doesn't care for anything but God. Can we say that honestly to God? Can we honestly tell God, I have absolutely no interest in any kind of bodily comforts or pleasures. I have absolutely zero interest in any kind of recognition or name and fame. Can we? Probably not. As spiritual aspirants, probably none of us can until we've attained the highest goal of God realization, of self, self realization. So the question is, well, aren't we lying to God then? This is the question that I came up with. But here's another thing about prayer. The primary purpose of prayer is not to inform God of anything. Why? Because God is omniscient. He already knows what's in our minds. He knows everything. Do you, do you, don't you think that he knows exactly what we're going to ask for? No. So we're not telling him something he doesn't know. That's not the purpose of prayer. The aim of prayer is actually to transform us. So Kierkegaard put this really beautifully. He said, Where did it go? Uh, it's there somewhere. I'm going to have to paraphrase. because He says, the aim of prayer is not to influence God, like you're lobbying God for something, but for you yourself to be transformed. That's the main, that's the main thing behind prayer. And so likewise, Sri Ramakrishna would often say, always tell yourself, never say you're a sinner. Of course, we, all of us have committed sins, if not in this life, then in a previous life. So there's nobody who's not, who has not committed sins. But he says, never tell yourself you're a sinner. Say, I am already liberated. Because that will help you to become liberated. And one of the books, one of the few books that he kept with him as, as his own personal property was Ashtavakra Samhita. And there's a line there, Muktabhimani Muktohi Baddho Baddhabhimanyapi in Sanskrit, which means that person who constantly thinks of him or herself as liberated becomes liberated. And that person who constantly thinks of him or herself as bound will always remain bound. That's the idea. So even if you're not liberated, it's still good to tell yourself you're liberated. Even if you don't want, even if you do have some desire for name and fame and worldly pleasures, in earnest prayer, when you talk to God and say, I don't want any bodily comforts, I don't want name and fame, that's a way of actually becoming what you're praying for. So prayer is not just, it's not primarily about giving information, conveying information to God, it's about transforming yourself. And you're actually changing who you are in the act of prayer. That's the important thing. So that's one way I thought about how I, we could respond to this kind of doubt that some people might have. And finally, let me end the, the talk with a few practical tips about spiritual practice and how we can effectively engage in prayer practice. First, another common mistake that people make is, that, is to kind of bifurcate their spiritual, their, their life into spiritual practice and everything else. So spiritual practices, morning and evening, 
my guru tells me to wake up and sit in the shrine for a certain amount of time and I repeat, I tell my beads or I, you know, take God's name or whatever, whatever the practice is. And then I come out of the room and then I argue with my spouse and I yell at my kids and then I go to work and argue with my coworker. No. So the idea is that you should try to spiritualize every moment of your life. That's extremely important. And prayer helps us to do that. Because if prayer means communicating with God in any way, a really useful way of spiritualizing every moment of our life is to try to engage in some form of communication with God at all times. There's no one size fits all formula for that. Figure it out for yourself based on your life commitments and what you're doing on it, what your daily routine involves. You'll figure it out. And apart from the eight ways of praying that I gave you, there are many more. You, I'm sure you can come up with your own ways. Of any way of communicating with God is a form of prayer. Second practical tip. Often when we read the gospel, we even monks will sometimes wonder, like, should we take what Sri is saying absolutely literally? Some of the things. This, there's one of, so one of these teachings that this often comes up when he would say, pray with tears in your eye. Did he mean it literally? I think he did. I think it's very useful and helpful in our spiritual life to, to literally, when we pray, we should try to pray with tears in our eyes. And I've already told you why. But I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, because tears are a sign of sincerity. Even in worldly life, if somebody's crying, except if you're a very good actor, then you can, you know, you, you can shed what are called crocodile tears. But if you're not a seasoned actor, it's very hard to pretend to be crying like that. If you, there are tears, people know you're, you, you, you're feeling something genuine. It could be something very worldly, but it's still genuine. You lost a million dollars, but it's still genuine feeling. You're distraught about it. Right? And Shabbat will he'll even say, this is very interesting, and I've confirmed this for myself. He says that when people pray for or cry about something worldly, the tears come from the inner corners of the eyes. And when people uh, cry as a result of spiritual things, crying for God, for instance, the tears come from the outside of the eyes. It's very interesting. Think about that. Um, Another thing, this is in the same context, actually. Even if it's very hard to bring ourselves to actually pray with tears in our eyes, maybe most of us, we just can't. It'll feel artificial and it won't work. One beautiful way to help us to do this is music. I've already mentioned this, but I think it's really helpful. Privately, listen to a beautiful spiritual song. It could be a bhajan. Most Indian bhajans are just prayers. And so if you listen with concentration, this is a very, very easy and effective way to literally pray with tears in your eyes and to feel, as I said, get a glimpse of what true spiritual longing, the longing of saints, really feels like just for a few seconds or moments. So music is very powerful in praying with, with tears in your eyes. Third, for those of you who have received initiation in uh, a tradition that tells you to re mentally repeat a mantra to do japa, so in our tradition and many others, not just in India, but as I said, even Christianity, you find these similar practices. One, I think, very practical tip is when you do japa, try to do it like a prayer. Take God's name, repeat that mantra as if you're praying and directly calling on God. So a simple way to put this is do japa in the second person. Like, right? So whatever your mantra is, Instead of thinking, often what happens is we, we feel some distance when we repeat the mantra because it feels like we're calling on, we're, we're taking God's name, right? Japa in the second person means every time you repeat his name, you're calling directly on God, just as a mother is calling on her son or, or, or daughter by calling her child by name. You're literally calling on God every time you repeat the mantra. That's doing japa in the second person. Second person means you, right? Instead of I, it's you. And it's not third person. So instead of doing japa in the third person, do japa in the second person. I think that's very helpful. And fourth, I've already mentioned this, but I'll say it one more time. What should we pray for? Better to pray for spiritual things. When it's verbal petitionary prayer, when you're actually asking God for something. But remember, you can also see, most of us as spiritual aspirants, we have all sorts of worldly desires. Confess those worldly desires to God too. And say, look, I want to be praying for only spiritual things, but I can't because I really want that Lamborghini. But tell God, you see, uh, Girish Ghosh, one of the great 
householder disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. He was an alcoholic. And when he came to Sri Ramakrishna complaining about how he can't overcome this alcoholism problem, Sri Ramakrishna said, okay, then listen. Anytime you feel an impulse to drink, just offer it to Divine Mother first. He didn't say to feel guilty about, he didn't even say stop drinking. Whenever you feel that impulse, offer it to Mother first. And he did it, and eventually he stopped drinking altogether. That's the beauty of it. All right, I'll end on that note. Thank you. <laughs>